Welcome. In this module, we'll take a look at the eight-step methodology, and this is the second of the uh, eight-step methodology series. So in step one, what are we doing? We are identifying the critical assets and the asset owner in the eight-step uh, methodology. We identify the critical asset and the asset owner. And what does this mean? So there are a lot of assets which need to be hardened. And when you're starting the hardening process, we have to look at a high level. And we have to look at important assets, but we have to look at low-hanging fruit as well because we don't want to get into too much complexity um, in, in, and get into too much of a difficult job because in the entire project, you have to security harden pretty much your entire IT infrastructure, which includes your routers, your servers, your switches, um, uh, you know, and all of those devices have to be hardened and your firewalls, for example. So you look at the asset inventory and infrastructure diagram overall and, and you get a feel for what do you have. You examine the risks and you look at the placement and obviously, you know, the edge devices have a little bit more risk because they're, they're the first ones receiving or hosting uh, uh, the first ones to be hit if there's an attack, for example. Um, the data center is a very important area, so all the servers are obviously very important. You, so you examine the risks at a high level, not getting into too much of an academic risk management exercise. Then you analyze the assets at a high level and you start prioritizing. What are we going to do first? What's the low-hanging fruit? Uh, what's the minimum security baseline? I'll talk about that. And the minimum security baseline is what you establish because the minimum security baseline actually means we have to, we have to harden the routers, the switches, the servers, and the edge firewalls uh, as well. It's obvious. And that, when you say that, that actually becomes your minimum security baseline and that forms your priority. And then you break up this entire work into phases and you have to start somewhere. So this is a view of the diagram um, which shows the eight-step methodology. You identify the critical assets and asset owner. And now the, in step number one, you're really going to pick up what are we going to do first? And many times when we start a project, what we actually do is we do the routers and the firewalls first, or we do all the switches first. Or, and in parallel, we start addressing the servers because they are being done by two different teams. And in step number two, research on applicable security controls. Now, in step two, what does this actually mean? research on applicable security controls. So CIS, Center for Internet Security, and DISA are two global leading frameworks, uh, benchmarks really, and these are used for hardening, and you really don't need to look much further uh, because they cover pretty much everything. There are exceptions because sometimes you have to go to OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project, sometimes to some other places. But CIS and DISA, other than most of the software, um, they cover all the infrastructure. And then you search on Google because you have to go through this process. You review the standards and the frameworks, ISO 27001, PCI, look at OWASP, look at Cloud Security Alliance, look at NIST um, and the CIS Top 20 Security Controls, um, and you start making a selection of the controls. You have to know what's out there in controls before you finalize which controls to implement. And as a benchmark or as a, as a standard for the organization, organizations usually pick CIS or DISA. Step three, checklist of applicable security controls. So now that you've done step one, you've looked at all the assets, you've selected what to do first, and then you've done the research, you start making a checklist for progress tracking and you share with the appropriate IT team. IT team and this forms, the checklist forms a trail for all the work which you're gonna do from now on. Step four, you document the controls into an SOP because we're trying to establish an environment in which there's a process. And for a process to be there, it has to be documented. We're not going to get into too much documentation because we have limited energy and time and we have to direct that into hardening the assets. But there's a minimal amount of checklist development and SOP um, so that, you know, this becomes a part of the culture of the teams. So you enter the control set into the draft SOP. Right now it's a draft. Who will do what when, um, who will do what and when is really what we're going to talk about. And then you get the department head to agree and sign off on the SOP. Thank you.